I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual. 起立，面向佛堂，参加先鞠躬，一鞠躬，再鞠躬，三鞠躬，参加各位的传师鞠躬，开班一鞠躬，请坐下。Now we're going to get into the、uh, the last、uh, three lines. Of seventy-one,、uh, starting with five, 圣人不病 So to break it down, 圣人 the first character means、uh, sacred or divine. Second character, 人 is a person, and then 不 means no, and then 病 is the character that we've been speaking about. It's not sickness; it's about flaw. So if you were to translate literally, it becomes like divine person, you know, not flaw. And what it really is is divine person is a person whose wisdom is so great that he or she approaches the divine. So that's a sage. Bu is without or not, and Bing is false, as we talk about. Everything should make a lot a, a lot more sense. It's not talking about the sages don't get sick. Of course they do sometimes. No different、uh, than other people. Perhaps they're a bit better off because they do watch, they do look after their、uh, physical practices in terms of health and longevity. So they will eat right and rest and exercise in the appropriate balance. So perhaps are, they're more healthy than the typical person, but they can get sick sometimes. So now you can tell what it says. Sen ren bu bing. It's really saying that the sages actively work on themselves to get rid of their flaws. That is what makes more sense. So, when you encounter some of these people, and it doesn't have to be a, a living sage, it could just be someone who has been cultivated, cultivating the authentic Tao. After a while, you see a difference in a person who has been working to perfect themselves. They become more spiritually attuned. They can be calmer in a difficult situation. They can handle everyday life with much more skill than than the average bear. <clears throat> okay, so line six. This is now the next to last line. So it's because they recognize the fault as a fault. Once again, we see the repetition of the character being, being, being. So, being being recognizing the fault as a fault, it all starts with the recognition of a problem. So this is all done through self-reflection. Now you can't necessarily rely on other people to tell you, although sometimes that's extremely valuable feedback, extremely valuable input that you can incorporate into your thinking. So the idea is that someone says, "No, you know, you were just、uh, you were too aggressive there, coming on too strong," and you can then think that, "Wow, okay, well, there may be something to that. Perhaps I wasn't seeing it." So self-reflection. Here's the bottom line: Authentic Dao cultivators review their own conducts on a regular basis. So whether Uh, whatever their situation happens to be, if they cultivate the authentic Tao, they always turn the gaze inward, rather than to look outward at other people's problems. They turn inward to note where they may have done other people wrong. So, this is formalized in the Yiguan Dao daily rituals,、uh, and I know that people are not familiar with that. So for Bill and Nate,、uh, those of you who have gone through the rituals,、uh, what I like to do, what I would like to do, is to point out the place where that self-reflection takes place in the rituals. Take you through it, so you understand at least what people are saying when they get to that part of the ritual. So take a look at this. In the In the book on the Yiguan Dao disciplines and rituals, it's divided into two parts. On the left-hand side, you've got the original Chinese, the Mandarin. You've got the way it sounds, how it's supposed to sound, denoted 
in sort of a pinion-like system, but it's not exactly pinion. It's meant to be easy to follow. So, and then on the right-hand side, you see the translation to figure out exactly what it's saying. So this is what I would like to take you through. I think we'll give you an insight into the Dao practice that is really not available from any other source. Okay. I'm highlighting these passages. The top square that you see here corresponds to the top square over here. So let me take you through them. On the on this side, on the left hand side, we start with Mi Le Zu Si. So Mi Le, the first two characters, that's Maitreya. So Maitreya is the Buddha that is foretold in the Buddhist version of prophecy about the future as the Buddha who will come to uh, spread Buddhist teachings throughout the land. So the the one that's coming. Uh, if you think about popular entertainment, that's a long-standing archetype for uh, the tales, the legends that human beings tell one another. Uh, so there's the, the prophecy says that someone will come who bears a certain mark and that person will do great things and, and be the salvation for the rest. So this is the Maitreya is the equivalence in Buddhism. Then we have two characters, Zhu Shi, Zhu. The third character means ancestor. In this case, it means a spiritual ancestor or the source of spiritual teachings. Shi, the last character in that collection of four, that means teacher. In this case, a spiritual teacher. So altogether, Mi Le Zhu Shi, that's just Maitreya Buddha. Miao Fa Wu Bian, that's the next sentence over here with wondrous dharma that is infinite. So to break down a little bit, miao fa, the first two characters, that's wondrous dharma. Fa, the second character there in that collection of four, fa is a commonly used character denoting dharma. So Buddhist dharma means Buddhist teachings. Uh, dharma in general means teaching or wisdom in general. Then we have the last two characters, wu bian, it means without boundary or without limits. So translation, infinite. So mi le zu shi fa wu bian, maitreya buddha with wondrous dharma that is infinite. Then it says, hu bi zhong shen, that means protect. The first two characters mean protect. Zhong shen means all sentient beings. So the power, the spiritual the spiritual power, the divine power of the Maitreya Buddha with the wondrous dharma that is infinite protects all sentient beings. So this is a declaration to start with on that particular Buddha. Then we get to the important stuff. Tan hui fo tian. It says, Tan uh, hui means repent or I repent. Tan hui, to regret, to show contrition for something to be contrite. I repent before the Buddha. Fo qian, fo means Buddha, qian means in front of. So I repent before the Buddha. Why? Gai guo zi xin. Gai means to correct or change. Guo means a mistake that you have made. Zi is self. Xin, last character there, means new. So it means correct my errors and renew myself. Why? So that Tong Zhu Tian Pan, Tong means together. So Zhu is to complete Tian, heaven, Pan, the work, the heavenly, the work of the heavenly mission. That's just a rough translation. We could go into Tong Zhu Tian Pan in much greater detail. For now, I'm just going to leave it at complete the heavenly work together. And then San Kashou, and that means three telltales. So the focus, as you can probably figure out, is in the part where it says, I repent before the Buddha to correct my errors and renew myself so that we may complete the heavenly work together. To complete the heavenly work together is a symbolic way of talking about how when you practice the teachings of spirituality in life, 
you have a positive influence on other people around you. When you influence them, influence them in a positive way, you are doing the heavenly mission. You are completing the heavenly work. Heavenly, in this case, is synonymous with the Tao. When you bring people onto the right path, when you help them, guide them, nudge them onto the right path, you are doing the work of the heavenly mission. So it's not something that's just restricted to, to, the, to the teachers, to the masters. It's something that everyone can and should do. It's a, it's a duty that I would, I would charge you with, that you want to make sure you are cultivating yourself, get yourself on solid ground spiritually, then you can look around and see about other people to whom you can extend a helping hand. Okay, so a little ways down, you've got Fan Xi Fu Tang Bian Dao Cuo Luan, and that's translated. Uh, so let's go uh, four characters at a time, like we did before. For everything related or associated to the temple, which, by the way, just means light itself, because there is not really anything uh, about the Tao that's separate and apart from the Tao. If I have done anything wrong, and that's, uh, that's just a very general, generic way to uh, translate Gen Dao Cuo Luan. Gen Dao Cuo Luan means uh, everything is askew, everything is twisted, everything is distorted. Um, you know, when you make uh, errors, when you cause a problem, you're bringing about chaos. So chaos is what those four characters are denoting. Um, in conventional, in colloquial English, in everyday talk, we might say, uh, don't get it twisted. So get, getting it twisted is what those four characters correspond to in, in uh, classical Chinese. And then, uh, so here what you're saying is that may the great teacher uh, here, we're, go, we're back to Zhu Shi, and Zhu means, again, that means ancestor, in this case, spiritual ancestor, and then Shi, teacher, in this case, spiritual teacher. So translated as the great teacher, may the great teacher forgive me. And then 10, Kosho, 10 Kaltaos. So this is the other part of it. That's about, that's about noting your problem as a problem. So recognizing that the fault is a fault and therefore seeking the grace of forgiveness. And usually the idea is that the hope is that when you are looking at yourself that way, when you are understanding what it really means, that will lead you to reflect upon what was done to other people that's less than your ideal for yourself. And therefore you will then think about potential possible remedy for the situation whether it's to uh, approach the other person, apologize, or, or to remedy the situation by doing something to undo the wrong that you have done. Okay, so this is, um, this is a quick look into a small part of the disciplines and rituals, the midday rituals that people do all the time. My interest is in having people understand what it means so they are not just going through the motions uh, sounding out the words, but without really engaging the mind in applying the Tao to life. Now, this is, this is not unique. I mean, this is all being expressed to you in terms that are related to the Tao in Buddhism, but this is not unique to the Tao. This is not unique to Yuan Tao. So here's what I want to showcase and talk about. There is a common spiritual core for all mankind so this concept is actually common to most traditions. And when I'm talking about traditions, I mean spiritual traditions, wisdom traditions, uh, religious institutions. Uh, the idea is a common one, starting with the sacrament of penance. So you know this better as the confessional. So for Catholics, the idea and the ideal of, the, of penance, this particular sacrament is that the act of engaging in the confessional it's healing for the soul to disclose you know forgive me father for i have sinned it's been well in my case it's been 40 years since uh, it's been 50 it's been 50 plus years since my last confessional mm -hmm. um 
and you want to regain the grace of God because through sinning you have lost that grace. But if you were to engage the sacrament of penance, you regain the grace of God. So this is, to me, this is a very poetic way to say that if you recognize a fault as a fault, if you recognize a problem as a problem, that I've done someone wrong, I've done something wrong, then the possibility is there for you to make things better for yourself, the healing and also strength for yourself. <clears throat> so it can be a very beautiful thing. Now, there are, uh, that's, you know, for the uh, practicing Catholics, of course, there are many variations of that, depending on which sect, uh, branch of Christianity uh, is most familiar to you, uh, perhaps the one that you were raised in. So many different variations, where it says private prayer, that's one variation among many. So the idea is that, uh, in, the idea from that particular practice of Christianity is that you don't actually need a priest to act as the intermediary between you and the divine. So Jesus Christ is the only intermediary that you need to confess your sins to, to be absolved of your sins. Uh, if you are uh, turning to Christ uh, for redemption, for absolution, that is actually more uh, real and more direct than to go through a human being. So I respect that. I understand the idea. And I can, I can see I can see the sense that it makes. But the basis is the same that when you are engaged in a private prayer, turning to Christ for absolution, you are also recognizing a problem as a problem. You are also identifying a flaw as a flaw and something that was wrong that you did unto someone else. You're recognizing the wrongness of that. <clears throat> there are cases in variations of Christianity where your transgression has caused you to be, to be um, excluded from a church, from the gathering uh, at a church, to be excommunicated, to be kicked out, so to speak. And therefore, for those particular variations, the idea is that to be readmitted to the flock, you have to engage in a public confession, you have to declare. Uh, you have to show how contrite you are before being readmitted to to the church. So these are just two of the many different variations in that we find in Christianity. Uh, I just want to emphasize that the basic basis is the same. Outside the church, we see the same idea reflected in different secular manifestations, uh, oftentimes invoking the name of God or Jesus. So. In Alcoholics Anonymous, step number five of the 12-step program, you have to admit, you have to admit to God, to yourself, to other people, the exact nature of our wrongs. And when you are able to do that, that admission actually becomes a source of strength. If you engage in uh, remedying your mistake, if you think about how you can make up for the, for the uh, problems that you have caused, uh, the pain that you have inflicted on other people. And you know you know, and I know when someone joins the Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a serious problem with alcohol. They have probably taken a wrecking ball to their lives and the lives of the people around them. So there will be plenty of things to admit to, plenty of things to seek forgiveness for. Now, the, the, uh, once again, the fundamental, uh, the foundation of this application is the same as everything else on this slide, and that is you must recognize a problem as a problem. You know, I got a problem with alcohol, I have to admit it, or I did something wrong to other people in my, in my drunken uh, lack of judgment. You know, I've, uh, I've done them wrong, and I have to seek forgiveness for that. You're recognizing a fault as a fault. So... <clears throat> This, we can now see that this idea is central to most of humanity. Uh, you know, we could also go on and talk about Islam. We can, we can talk about Judaism and other major religious outlooks, but you're gonna find the same ideas over and over again. And that is, you gotta see, you gotta know, you gotta recognize for yourself that this is, this is wrong, this is bad. <clears throat> so,
when you have that recognition, you can do something about it. So ultimately, this is about being completely honest with yourself. We are really the best at the trick of fooling ourselves. We know where we, we know the best way, the most effective techniques to fool ourselves. We know our own weakness. It's the avoidance of self-delusions, including the spiritual cliche that you are already perfect. So, you know, for the preparation of this presentation, I did my research, I did my search in Google about the phrase, you are already perfect. Wow, are there many hits? You know, so this is a very common thing that people say, you probably have encountered people saying that. You probably have seen it in books, you have seen it in websites. So think about this idea, you are already perfect. And let me go back to the last slide just for a quick moment. You are already perfect flies in the face of all of these. If you are already perfect, then it seems odd that you have to engage in a confessional or to, or to privately pray to Jesus Christ for redemption or absolution or to recognize that you have done so wrong. So I would, I would say that the cliche is the very opposite of that spiritual core. And I would make a very strong statement here. The authentic Tao is actually quite the opposite, quite the opposite to say that you're already perfect. And I don't, I don't want anyone to get this twisted. What I'm trying to say here is that you are so imperfect and flawed that you should be depressed. You should be really hard on yourself. That's not the Tao. I want you to talk about what the Tao actually is. So the Tao isn't that you are already perfect, but the Tao also isn't you are a worthless sinner. What is the Tao then? Why do people say you are already perfect? Well, first of all, it's what everyone wants to hear. Oh, I'm already perfect. Okay, great. Cool. That makes me happy to know that I'm already perfect. And another reason for saying that is also because people have driven themselves nuts trying to change that which about themselves they perceive to be imperfect. So I can understand why so many spiritual teachers say you are already perfect. At the same time, I also will note that the people who really do believe in that, they have glossed over all the problems they have in life and therefore they end up making no transformation whatsoever. They're usually stuck in a state. I have a number of friends that I know when I began this journey on the Tao, you know, people that I've known for 20, 30 years, they are subscribers to that belief system. So today, 2017, I know where these people are. I know how they're doing in life. And I can tell you things have gotten worse for them. Whereas everybody else that have gone on the authentic path, things are better and better for them. I have so many different, I have so much evidence for this in the lives of the people who actually live. They follow one path, they follow the other path. I look at where they are today. It's like night and day. So let me explain. Let me explain why. Let me explain why that is. This is, this is important for us to figure out. What's wrong with that particular idea that, that you are already perfect? What, why can I not already be perfect? Well, why, why should you believe you are already perfect? Well, one reason is because, you see, you mustn't feel dissatisfied about yourself or your life. You know, dissatisfaction, that sucks. I'm not dissatisfied, and that's, an e that's a feeling of unease. So you should not feel dissatisfied. If you believe that you're already perfect, you will feel satisfied and not dissatisfied. Okay, that's not the Tao. The Tao is that the power, the driving force of cultivation, why do we cultivate? It doesn't come from dissatisfaction about your life. Not really. I'll talk about the essence of the Tao. The idea is that you have a natural tendency to flow toward the best version of yourself. Let me explain. You all know, everybody knows, we all know that we are only at this moment living a fraction of our true potential. 
And we also know from the past that whenever we can manifest more of our potential, we've had the times of our lives when we could do that. When we develop more of our potential, boy, that was an exciting time. I was happy with myself. You know, I, I knew that I could do more and I did more and, and it felt great. So there's a natural part of yourself that's yearning for that. Path, the path of doubt cultivation is the, the path that takes you toward the increasing manifestation and realization and fulfillment of your true potential. And even going beyond that potential, think about the times when you did something and you look at yourself and said, I had no idea that I could do that. Wow, I have gone beyond what I thought was the envelope for myself. You know, think about how, hap how happy you were. That is the real driving force, not discontentment, but yeah, I can do this and I can flow toward the ideal, the vision that I have for myself of who I can be, not as I am right now, but the better, better version, the best version of myself that I know I'm capable of becoming. So that's, that's the authentic doubt. It's not about dissatisfaction. Okay, well, what's next? You should believe you're already perfect because you shouldn't spend so much energy trying to change things. Well, I look at society and I see that people who are feeling dissatisfied, they definitely spend a lot of energy and effort and time trying to change themselves. And a lot of times it's a fool's errand. And what I mean by that is that it's a fruitless search. They end up empty handed. So to prevent themselves from experiencing the disappointment of trying to change things after spending so much energy, they should believe that they are already perfect. So they would not engage in that pursuit. That makes sense. At the same time, that's also not the doubt, because when you are on the path of Tao cultivation, when you are transforming your life in accordance with the Tao, it isn't something that requires strife or striving or struggle. It requires a little effort because it's the natural flow. You're going along the flow toward the best version of yourself, and it's something that you've always had. It's something that's, that was always within you. So going with the natural flow is not something that you have to fight. If you have to fight it, you have to struggle against it, then, then yeah, I can see, I can see why, you, why you have this belief about being already perfect, but that's not the doubt. Okay, so I think uh, it's starting to, I think, dawn on everyone uh, where I'm going with this, so I'll just do a couple more. You should believe you're already perfect because why? Because, well, you see, you shouldn't compare yourself against other people. So social competition is a serious problem, is a serious stressor, is something that causes a lot of tension. You know, oh, I, you know, my car is not as, as uh, expensive as his car. My house is not as big as his house. Uh, he's got a promotion. I don't have a promotion. He's making more money than I'm making. The, that kind of competition that also drives people nuts. So if you believe that you're already perfect, then you will not be so, um, you will not be so attached to comparisons of yourself against other people. I can see, I can understand why people say that at the same time, that's also not the doubt. Doubt cultivators do not compare themselves against other people. You compare yourself against yourself. That is to say, you want to know that you are a better person today than you were yesterday, and tomorrow you're going to be a better person again than the person you are now. <clears throat> so comparison against other people is, a, is also a fool's errand. You end up with no winners all around. But comparing yourself against yourself, bettering yourself, improving yourself, taking another step forward, you become the ultimate winner. Okay, so last one. Believing you are perfect makes you happy no matter what, no matter what is happening around you. So the idea is that, well, if you don't believe that you're already perfect, then you'll be depressed. You will not be happy. If you did believe that you were already perfect, then no matter what else is going on around you, you can have your happiness. Even when your life is breaking apart, even when things are disintegrating all around you, you can still be happy. 
when you believe that you're already perfect. So I would say that's pretty bad advice in life. <clears throat> number one, and number two, I would also caution anyone against using the belief of perfection, your own perfection, as the source of happiness. Because no matter how much you repeat to yourself about how perfect you already are, there is a part of you that knows the truth. And that truth is that there is room for improvement. Let's just be very honest. There's room for improvement in you, in me, in everybody. So that is going to, to work against this artificial, um, synthetic, made up belief that you're already perfect, they will be at odds. There's that internal conflict that can, that can cause other problems or issues in your thinking. So now, having identified that as a bad source of happiness, I'd like to talk about the better source of happiness. Uh, true happiness comes from the awareness that you are making meaningful progress. So let me, let me explain. <clears throat> I, I find the best example of seeing this in reality to be when you look at kids. When you interact with kids, preferably a whole bunch of kids, different kids that are engaged in different things, and note the ones that are truly happy, the ones that have inner happiness. Those are the kids, whether it's elementary school or high school, these are the kids that are engaged in something to better themselves. The kids that are on the team, and it could be any sports activity, could be could be track and field, could be um, could be swimming, could be anything. The kids that are working on themselves to be better at what they what they do, whether it's physically or mentally, those kids are truly happy. Even if that to get up super early in the morning to be to to practice. Even, even then, they're, they're still happy. So, you know, I know a couple of uh, teenage girls. I've uh, known them since they were very little. They are now engaged in ice skating practice. They have to get up at 4 o'clock every morning. So they'll talk about that. Oh, we have to get up at 4 o'clock every morning. And so, you know, uh, if I were to suggest something like, why don't you quit the team? And it's like, oh, oh no, 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 we love it. What? Yeah, they love it because it's a source of true happiness to see you, you yourself, fulfill your potential, to make more use of the potential that you all that you that you always knew was there. That you knew you'd be wasting. Now look at the flip side. How about the kids that don't have the this true source of happiness? I can point them out quite easily. These are the kids who are usually spending a lot of time in video games, in chatting with friends, using their various electronic devices. And at the same time, these are also the kids who will say that familiar phrase, I'm bored. This is so boring, okay? But wait a minute, you have Nintendo, you have, you have the Xbox, you have this, you have that. You've got all these different titles. Well, those are temporary measures to distract. So they'll they'll get the latest game. They'll 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 play. They'll play through it. They'll spend hours on it. For a while, they are numb. For a while, the game numbs them to the reality that they are not making full use of their potential. That they are not working on themselves. So when they're done with the game, oh, I'm tired of this game, then reality sets in. And the reality is, I'm bored. These are not the kids that are truly happy. So the difference could not be more stark, could not be greater between the two groups. The kids working on themselves and the kids who are numbing themselves. So it's the same with adults. Never mind teenagers, never mind kids. It's the same for us. It's the same for people who have grown out of, of that phase, out of high school for many years. You're still you, you're still the same kid that you were back in high school. You will be happy if you work on yourself. You will be happy if you utilize more of the potential that you already know is there. You will be unhappy if you waste that potential. That's, that's the real doubt. So 
going back to the believing that you're uh, already perfect, that whole concept seems so flawed in itself that I always put it right with like a mental breakdown image in my head. <laughs> like it just leads to that because of life, because of yeah. ups and downs, and that seems like what, uh, I mean, to the point where we joke around about being perfect, but in a sarcastic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I think, you know, there's a long history of, of that concept being around in, in Western culture, and some of it I can completely understand where people are coming from. Uh, I can see, for instance, the, the validity, the very true validity that you have to trust yourself to make, to make a decision about something. Because, you know, the people that are, are, have fallen into this whole area of thinking they may have turned away from a very toxic kind of religious practice where there is constantly, constantly being told that you've fallen from grace, that you are, you are sinful, you are by nature sinful as a human being, therefore you don't know what's best for yourself, you have to turn to a power external to you, a power other than yourself, for guidance. And of course, coincidentally, that power happens to be the church, you know. That's the interested party to have your obedience. I can see people being turned off by that and then turn around, go to the other extreme and say, well, I don't need you. I'm perfect already with everything, you know? So I think between the two extremes, we have a nice equilibrium that is the Tao where you are able to trust that part of yourself, that divine spark within about what to do. You can trust your own judgment. You know, you can trust, you can trust that you know there's a deep part of you that knows that you want to be this version of yourself uh, that is within reach that you are capable of. Let's go ahead and do the meeting and the ritual, everybody. Shiri. Okay, everybody, we are done.